for me. The first reading. Forty days more, and Nineveh will be destroyed. We hear Jonah proclaiming a message. And of course, you know what happened when Jonah was called the first time. God said, Jonah, go that way. And Jonah said, right. And he went the other way. The important thing is to realize the analogy between Nineveh and today. Today our culture is in a similar place. We are headed into a place that if we continue on our current path, it will be destruction. Not just economic, but social destruction. And so tomorrow we celebrate the 39th anniversary of the proclamation of Roe v. Wade, where the government said that it is legal to have an abortion. We know, of course, that that is not legal in the eyes of God, but still, it is a law contrary to um, God's word. But it challenges us. And so it's important to understand and to put into perspective the significance of that decision. Think about how many people died in World War II? About 220,000? Around 200, less, of, right around a quarter million people. That's a lot of people. But we need something as an analogy or a reference to kind of measure that. I, I thought of something that would work as a good analogy. I won't tell you where I thought of this idea. <laughs> I leave that up to your creative imagination. So. If we wanted to compare, let's say, the Iraq War, we would have maybe one, one little square. And if we wanted to compare it to World War I, we'd be about here. World War II, this would be about how many people died in World War II. Now, here's the server. Could I ask for your assistance down here? That's why she gets paid the big bucks. <laughs> now, if we go to the Civil War, just hold it there, about, about this many people died. About this many people died. But since 1973, this is how many people have died with, as a result of legal abortion in this country. There we go. Hi, Mom. Oh. <laughs> Now, now, we're still going, but this is not without hope. I have a friend of mine, his name is Father Steve Bauer, not Father Steve Bauer is the priest who was here, but Father Steve Bauer, he works in Chicago, and he offers Mass at the Women's Center. And at the Women's Center, they welcome women in there who are pregnant, and they have a pretty coy cover on their slogan. It says, it's your choice. And when they come in, they're offered an ultrasound so they can see what they're doing. And since they founded that women's center, they've been able to save about a child a day. So since they founded that, hundreds and hundreds of people have survived and lived to tell about it. Now, whoa, this church is the same size as oil. That's as far as I got. Now, I went eight feet for the Civil War. And this war against life takes us all the way down the aisle, across, back down, over here, up, back, around, and down again, almost back to the front, two times around the church. About 35, 40 million people are lost. In now, is that a fair comparison? We're comparing people dying in a war to people dying in the womb. And what is the big difference? Body bags. Evidence. We don't have the remains of those who have died. They went where this toilet paper normally goes. Or into a dumpster. We don't have the evidence. And so it's, it's like out of sight and out of, out of mind. But there are some who help us to keep it in the forefront of our, our minds. Like Pro-Life Wisconsin and there's other Pro-Life groups around the country that help remind us of what's most important. And one of the biggest things that's happening this weekend is the March for Life. 
That's where some of the priests are. So there's a handful of priests that went with the group from La Crosse, which is about five or six busloads full. So there's approximately 250 kids. Last year, they sent 400, along with the Diocese of Fargo, to Washington, D.C. to march. And if you ever notice, watch the news and watch what's not covered. This is not accidental. The media, who has an agenda, does not want people to know this issue. They don't want people to know the truth. The truth of the matter is that we are losing 3,000 people in the society every day to this plague. It's far worse than any war. It's far greater than any Holocaust. But the problem is that there are no body bags. There's no evidence. There's nothing there. What do you end up with? One dead, one wounded. But the one who's dead, the evidence is gone. And that's the challenge. Now, we're not without hope. There is hope in this situation. We have people who are working politically and in other ways to help minimize the number of abortions that are taking place. Like my friend Father Bauer, he's working in Chicago and they have the Women's Center going there, saving about one kid each day. It's not much compared to the 3,000 each day that are lost, but if they had not been doing that work, that one would have been lost each day. And so we thank God for the work that they are doing. We also thank God for Bethesda Healing Ministries and all of these programs out there that are designed to help people recover. The most tragic or grief-filled confessions are those that priests hear from those men and women who have realized afterwards the consequences of what they have done and the deep scar that that leaves. We must continue to be welcoming to those who have fallen victim to what the media says is okay, what the government says is okay, and what they know in their hearts is not right. Another example is I have a friend named Rebecca, she's from Spencer. I won't go into last names, you might even know who it is, but she went to China. And within 48 hours of arriving, she was taking care of an infant and harboring a pregnant woman. Because if she went home, she wouldn't be pregnant anymore. And that's the sad state of affairs, if you will, in China. Even more grievous of an offense against human life than in our own country. So people can sometimes say to me, well, you know, Father, it's always going to be there. We're just going to go back to the back alleys and it's just going to cause death. And that's not, the right, that's not the right argument to have. It's like saying, well, there's always going to be murderers, so we might as well just, you know, let them go. No. That, that's, not, that's not the way we should be thinking. We should be thinking about, okay, what can we do to help stop this problem? What small steps can we take? What large steps can we take? How do we influence those people who are in public office to reconsider their vote and to understand the significance of what they are doing? I heard somebody that put this analogy forward with a political spin on it. They said, imagine you had the perfect candidate. He was a smooth talker. He was a good debater. He had the right economic policy. He had the right plan to fix the country. He was a good diplomat. Except that there was this one little thing that, that, that he was personally opposed to slavery, but who could understand it would be okay for others, perhaps, if they wanted to have a slave. And you hear that and you think, now, Father, that's absurd. That's just silly. Nobody would vote for anybody like that. But yet people out there are voting for the same thing with regards to abortion. They politicize it and they make it something different than it is. It is a matter of life and death. It is something that we need to take more seriously. It wasn't on the front of my radar screen until I started hanging out at the seminary and we would go down to the abortion mill and we would pray there. We weren't doing anything obnoxious. We had nice signs offering information to people who were going in there to help them, to show them 
that there was other ways. And most of the time we were not successful, but there were a couple times that two guys were able to talk, whoever it was going in there, not to going in there. What's the most difficult one to see is a young person going in with a parent. And knowing that we see them go in and we see them come out and we know, and they know, they're not the same. And it's tough to see that. But that's where we need to be. We need to be on the front lines. We need to be at that March for Life. So I would challenge every single one of you, if you're able to go, go to the March for Life on the 40th anniversary. It would be nothing more joyful than to watch Washington get shut down. You know, it's an amazing thing is that the March for Life is the biggest march that Washington sees every single year, but it's not covered because they don't want the message to get out. But the message is clear. Just like Jonah was proclaiming 40 days more and Nineveh will be destroyed, we in so many ways are destroying our own country. The replacement rate, population, we're, we're not even there unless you, if you include the Hispanics that are coming in from Mexico, we have a replacement rate. People in Europe are at 1.6 as far as you know, number of kids per couple. That means the nation is dying. They're, they're losing all their children. Now, if you look at the Muslims, their replacement rate is about eight. And that tells us something there. There are a lot of things going on there. And Jesus, in the gospel, is saying, come, and I will make you fishers of men. And God is saying the same thing to us. We need people who are in good marriages, in, in good vocations to the priesthood, in good vocations to the religious life, so that we can produce a generation that is life-giving, that will turn the tide of death, this tide of death. And you can see in some places where abortion was legal some years ago, and now euthanasia is legal. The killing of the elderly who are no longer useful and this is a challenge for us. We see it kind of at the bookends. And this is something we also saw in Germany in the 30s and the 40s. They were euthanizing people who were a burden to society. And the quality of a society and the godliness of a society is determined by how that society takes care of the most vulnerable. And so our marching orders are very clear. What exactly that marching order looks like in a specific detail depends on our state in life. Someone would say, well, I have a family. I can't go to the march. And a young person might say, I don't have the money. I can't go on the march. Put the two together. The person who can't go, give a scholarship to the young person who can go but can't afford it. To be a witness. I would love to be there again. I was there a while ago. And I got to sleep on the floor in the basement of Immaculate Conception Basilica that seats about 6,000. And then got up at 1 o'clock for an hour of adoration. Went back to bed and got up and went on the march. I heard speakers. I heard some very famous people talking about this. Roe v. Wade. You've heard of it. Most people don't know that Roe, Norma McCorvey, after this decision, went on and had her child gave birth to her child, became Roman Catholic, and is now one of the foremost advocates for life today. She's still there at the march each year. Now, she's not a great public speaker. She's not well-educated, but she is the witness to say, we made a mistake. We need to go back. We need to fix this in the small changes, in big changes. Some people would say, well, there's, I don't have a choice because both of the candidates are going to vote the same way. Well, find a candidate who won't. Run for office yourself. I know there are people in Madison, good people, people who were my parishioners, who are working in Madison, and they're constantly sending me emails about what they're doing to help in these areas. But they're kind of like, almost like Lone Rangers. There's so few there. So pray that God will send more fishers of men down to Madison and into Washington to help transform this life or this culture of death into a culture of life. We want to make sure that we are all doing our part, continually praying, constantly praying for life, praying that from the moment of conception till the moment of natural death, all life is preserved. 
It ties in very closely with a contraceptive mentality because if the contraceptive fails, which it often does, the society out there says, let's just take it to the next step. And that's where the abortion issue is so closely tied to the contraceptive issue. It's a whole mindset that's get, that gets set against life. And we need to work to help transform the world, to be leaven in the world, to be fishers of men, to be inviting people to think about that, to study ourselves so that we know the issues, so that we can defend the divine law, the natural law, the church's teaching on life. It is not beyond us. It is within our grasp. And so my challenge to you is to think about what are you going to be doing next year, January 22nd or January 23rd or whenever the march is? Is there someone that you could send if you can't go yourself to be a witness? God willing, I will be there next year again. But in the meantime, I will continue to be letting people know the reality of the world that we live in and the possibility and the hope that we have to transform that. We know the victory will be won. This battle of life will be won because God cannot be defeated. It is our job to help hasten that process, to prevent the loss of as many lives as possible, to bring peace, to bring life to this nation and to the whole world, and to recognize that life is precious, irreplaceable, and we must protect it from conception to death, from womb to tomb.